Kwekakina. Hello, everyone. Marci Miigwech e Nekirmik e Kayanamik to our elders for your important words of welcome and for opening this gathering in a good way. And thank you to our hosts and partners. Linigrusani Nindijnakas, Nijojoban Kinigiban Kirigon Zibi Anishnabeaki, Nidadaban Dashkin Onjibiban Arakwaro Itanya, Nindash Anishnabe Kwe Ashijitanya, Nikikanamago Queen's University. My name is Linda Grusani. My mother was born in Kitagon Zibi and Shnabeaki, and my father was born in Okuaro, Italy. I'm a member of the Kitagon Zibi Anishinaabe and of Italian heritage. I live on the unceded Anishinaabe territory that is also called Ottawa. I am a PhD candidate in the Cultural Studies program at Queen's University, studying full time, drawing on my work as a full time curator and arts administrator with privileged access to Indigenous collections in the National Capital Region for over 20 years. I am also a member of the Working Group for the Indigenous Collections Symposium 2021, Meshka Watong Mamawewewizen, Strengthening Our Bonds, Sharing Our Practices. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our first panel, Barriers to Access. We are starting the symposium by identifying a problem by talking about the kinds of barriers that prevent Indigenous communities and individuals from accessing museums and archival collections. But we are also starting by hearing from two speakers who have been active in projects that seek to remove those barriers and increase access for Indigenous peoples. I will start by introducing our first speaker, Janelle Doyle. Janelle Doyle is Inuk from Labrador. She has been an archivist at Library and Archives Canada, since September 2018 as part of the Listen, Hear Our Voices initiative. Janelle garnered international experience as the International Indigenous Intern in partnership with the Labrador Institute in 2018, where she spent two months in Rovaniemi, Finland, and an additional two months in Tromsø, Norway. Janelle, please go ahead and unmute. Nakomi. Nakomik Linda for your introduction and I would like to also say thank you to our elders for opening up the uh, conference today. So um, I'll go ahead and get started. As Linda said, I've been an archivist at Library and Archives Canada for the last couple of years. I started in 2018 and I was based out of Happy Valley Goose Bay at the time because the initiative um, was hiring seven Indigenous archivists from across Canada. And I am you know, from Labrador. My family is from Bolsters Rock, which is now resettled, but it's um, in the Sandwich Bay area on the south coast of Labrador. And my dad's side of the family is from the Avalon Peninsula of Newfoundland. Um, so right now I'm still at Library and Archives, but I'm also doing a Master of Information Studies at the University of Ottawa to continue uh, the work in the archival field. So we can go to the next slide. So here are my colleagues that I have been working with on the Listen, Hear Our Voices initiative at Library and Archives. So as I said, there were seven of us uh, from all around and I'll go to the next slide to show you where everyone else was from. So I was based out of Happy Valley Goose Bay. Another colleague of mine, Michelle, was based in Wendage. Another colleague, Taylor, based in Six, Six Nations. Um, then we had Delia in Thompson, Manitoba. Samara in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. We had Lindsay in the Okanagan Valley, BC, and then Angela in Whitehorse. So I'll go to the next slide. So the project was started in budget 2017 to respond to the TRC calls to action. Uh, and the project was, it had two main goals. I say this because it's concluding now, um, but the first goal was a funding project uh, recommended by our Indigenous Advisory Circle. And there were two cycles of funding launched for this, um, which meant that communities could, or organizations could apply for funding to do digitization or build capacity in their own communities when it came to um, specifically audiovisual material. Um, and the second was a free digitization service where LAC offered digitization in Gatineau, um, but if they chose to do this, then they wouldn't have to give up their rights to the material and LAC did not retain a copy of it. It was really just having a place to send it for free to get material digitized. So I'll go to the next. 
And all of this work has and will continue to be guided by our Indigenous Advisory Circle. Um, and they, we actually had a meeting not long ago. They have really helped us to focus on, on what's best, uh, how we can best serve them as, you know, a, a government body. Um, next slide. So myself and my colleagues sat down about two years ago now to talk about what barriers we've especially noticed through our work um, that our communities and the individuals in these communities face when trying to access archival material. And we noticed a lot of common things that we see popping up elsewhere too. Um, we're only just beginning to scratch the surface on this and there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. We'll go to the next slide. The first thing I want to touch on is uh, mistrust of institutions, especially government institutions. Um, we know that in the past and even to now, there's been a colonial legacy of collecting material. And a lot of times, especially uh, in the past, consent was not expressly given when material was collected. And so because of this, because of all these anthropologists and, and whatnot who went into communities to collect information, the material that exists in a lot of uh, federal and provincial institutions reflects mostly a colonial point of view. So we as archivists of LHOV, um, we're trying our best to engage with our communities um, and talk to people who worked at repositories in our communities just about what their needs are and try to break down that um, barrier. I know myself when I was growing up, Ottawa seemed like a world away and stuff to do with the federal government seemed like a world away. So it was nice to be able to be present in community and put a face uh, to, to things. <laughs> and then, um, as I mentioned before, LHOV did not require transference of copyright but we still understood that it was hard for some folks to send in their material kind of blindly um, to get digitized because of because of the past and how things usually have been so next slide so another thing i wanted to mention was connectivity um, i think in the era of covid19 we've definitely seen it's it's highlighted who has connectivity and who does not for people who didn't already know um, so internet can be really expensive in some communities, not even in like super northern areas, but there are communities that are even an hour outside of a city and they don't have very good internet connectivity. Um, so that makes it hard when we're in this digital age, we're digitizing a lot of material, it still doesn't make it accessible to everybody. Um, Images might not load, you might not be able to download that many things. Um, some people only have a certain amount of gigabytes that they can download per month. And so that makes it hard to even access online repositories. It's not, um, like digitization is not always a direct solution if you're accessing it online. So, um, yeah, for our digitization project in particular, uh, something I had an issue with was that our uh, funding application was only available in a downloadable PDF. So we had to put some other things in place to mitigate that issue. There was a lot of helping people fill out applications over the telephone, literally, uh, like you would help it, they would write it down and you would allow them to fax or scan it in instead. Um, or giving them a Word document, but it's not normal practice at LAC or it hadn't been until our project. Um, another thing about connectivity is that when it comes to even getting a new server, it can be hard for certain communities to consider like investing in that kind of a thing for documentary heritage when there's a lot of other community priorities. Um, a lot of places, have a housing shortage um, and other issues that need to be addressed first. So uh, next slide. Um, yeah, and another thing I wanted to touch on was that some uh, ways of accessing archival material online 
require you to have a lot of uh, prior knowledge of technology. So they're not super accessible for those who are not uh, literate in computer skills. I Even another example that's popped up during COVID, I had to help my grandparents register for their COVID-19 vaccination appointment last night. And the form that they had to go through, it was ridiculous. Like there was no way for them to do it over the phone either. So I didn't really understand that. But um, I know from an LAC perspective, we've launched a lot of uh, new search tools, but even I can find it hard sometimes to search through those. Um, so this is a huge barrier. If you're trying to search for something, you might not know what terms to use because um, from the back end, there are certain um, like tags that you could put in or uh, numbers, reference numbers. And this is just not, um, this is not super accessible to the public. Next slide. So as I mentioned, um, when we were going through our, our funding project, we quickly uh, added in a phone number so that people could call us and talk to us when they're going through the application process. Um, in some cases, before COVID, in the last funding cycle, we were physically going to communities to help people fill out applications, and then we would bring the application back with us if they were not able to scan it. Um, and we would try to get the word out about the funding program by going to community workshops, attending conferences. I know um, a colleague of mine, particularly Delia, held a workshop just to give uh, an Archives 101 training course for people who don't know what a finding aid is, um, what are phone, all these um, things that, you know, you only really learn if you're in the field. Um, so as far as I know, that was super well received and that's the kind of thing that we've identified as a priority uh, in our communities. Next slide. Another barrier that's uh, one of the more obvious ones is a geographic barrier. Even myself growing up in Labrador, we have small repositories like uh, Them Days and of course a couple museums, which are great. Um, but for the bulk of material, um, they're now held in St. John's, Newfoundland at the Rooms Provincial Archive. And that's the case too, when you think about um, federal materials. So those are located in Ottawa. And you can't just hop on a plane and uh, be flying places if you need to physically look at materials, because it's true that some material is restricted or you can't photocopy it for preservation reasons. Um, so it's not like you can view it that easily. And flights are super expensive, at least where I'm from. It's a thousand dollars just to get from Goose Bay to St. John's, which is the same province, but it's a five hour flight still because of all the stops that we have to make. So I can't imagine anybody, uh, especially if you're coming from the North Coast, it's an extra cost to get from somewhere like Nain to Goose Bay and then to St. John's just to consult archival material. It's not really um, practical. So I'll go to the next slide. So at the beginning of the project, again, uh, Normal Charbonneau, who's the deputy library and archivist of uh, Canada, he uh, went with a couple of us on community visits. Uh, we had hoped to get to a couple more places, but in the end, we got to Kongir, Siwak, Kudrak, Ekaluit, Inuvik, and Tuktoyokto. Uh, it was myself and Angela Code, who is Dene and lives in Whitehorse, Yukon. We got to go and talk to people and even do some project naming uh, activities. So we brought photos with us for people to have a look at if they wanted to identify. And um, later when COVID began, we started to use Zoom. Now we're using Microsoft Teams to do more face-to-face uh, -face meetings between us, like the seven archivists, because we never used to see each other. We would just sometimes have calls. Um, uh, and this was helpful to kind of keep in touch about what's going on in our regions. Next slide. 
So something I've kind of mentioned throughout that I wanted to touch on as a barrier is communication and language. Um, some elders in different regions are unilingual, and that doesn't mean English or French sometimes. Um, so it's really important that materials are translated. And I don't feel that we really did enough of that on this project, but we were we did have the opportunity to do some translation into Inupitut. Um, I believe there was some translation into uh, an Algonquin dialect. But even with the Inupitut translation, there are a lot of different dialects. Um, so it was not very easy and we still didn't uh, cater to everyone. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. So language is a barrier in another way, aside from just the language that um, you speak. Language can be a barrier when it's the terminology that you need to use, which I mentioned when I mentioned uh, computer literacy. Archives, for me, even coming into the field two years ago, it was really hard to navigate. I didn't know what these different terms were. And archives are not, you know, the way that we know them today, they're a Western concept. Um, so all of these ideas were kind of uh, colonial <laughs> originally, and they don't necessarily translate to um, different Indigenous languages and ideas that we have in our own cultures. So it makes, there's kind of a, a divide then when you're learning about archival language and how to navigate an archive um, and kind of how you have perceived uh, archives I guess if you want to call them archives or old stories, old photographs as you've grown up or in your life experience. Next slide. So um, we began thinking about how, how are people going to access these archives for legal purposes, genealogical purposes, without having this knowledge base that we were fortunate enough to get. And why are we only doing uh, like archives from this perspective? Next slide. So as I mentioned before, Delia Chartran actually facilitated a really helpful workshop. And then I was able to hold a community meeting after I had, um, after I had processed uh, the Carol Bryce Bennett collection. So the Carol Bryce Bennett collection, uh, which I did at the Labrador Institute, was a huge collection of materials that Carol Bryce Bennett, who was a researcher, collected through her time in Labrador. She um, did a lot of work on the Inuit land claim in Labrador that happened in 2004, and she wrote several books. Um, and people in the community were curious to know more about what was in the collection because it hadn't been available for people to kind of have a list of what's in it until I, I went in and helped do the finding aid. Um, so just sitting down and having like a, a conversation and then participating on a youth panel later was really a great way to let people know that the archives are even available and how to access them as simple as who to call, who to email and where to go. Um, and then later getting into, you know, if you need to find this, you can look at this finding aid and it will tell you which box number it's in. Um, because when you walk into an archive, it, you're looking up at all these boxes and it's just, it's a little overwhelming. So next slide. And then um, another barrier I wanted to mention is lack of funding. So this project was created to run for two years, but the demand has far far surpassed that and not everybody who applied for funding got the funding. Um, so a lot of uh, organizations rely on funding pot after funding pot hopping from pot to pot to continue work that's really important instead of uh, just having the availability of like a steady stream of funding to do these projects. And that can that can really have an effect on progress. Um, and, and then it keeps a lot of the material centralized in these um, more urban locations instead of having the opportunity to really uh, get to them on, on a community level. And like I said, other issues um, a lot of the times take precedent over documentary heritage material. Um, 
And then uh, another thing is that, you know, it, it would really even be great if people in community could be trained to do this material on their own. But where is that training coming from? There's not enough of it. And the funding just doesn't exist to keep up with it. So next slide. So we have this funding option, but again, it only lasted two years. So it's just scratching the surface. It was nice that we offered it, but it's, um, you know, it's putting the, it's putting the weight on a community to keep going with what they've started with this funding. So they're going to have to be searching elsewhere if they want to, to continue the projects that they started under our funding, which I view as a problem. Next slide. So moving forward, LAC developed an Indigenous Heritage Action Plan. Um, so they're going to be focusing on institutional change with this action plan. And hopefully it will be integrated into policies at different levels within the institution of time. Um, so it, it has a lot to do with how LAC describes their records, how LAC makes their records accessible who LAC consults with um, when, especially when we're talking about material that is about Indigenous people or that is by Indigenous people. Next slide. And we've also established a cultural guidelines working group at LAC and we're working with the Indigenous Advisory Circle on this. Um, so we talk about sticking points, like um, what it really needs to change for us to offer better services, because we have to change internally before things can change um, externally as we're engaging with people on the outside. So we've gathered feedback from these projects and from the Indigenous Advisory Circle, and we're developing a document that will hopefully be integrated into the action plan um, as a recommended way forward within the institution. Next slide. And we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I, I feel like I find something every day that I think oh, we should probably improve on this. And um, there's a lot of collaboration going on. And ultimately, when it comes down to it, we need more First Nations, Inuit, and Métis uh, Nation people to be working uh, at LAC. But you know, it's uh, it's hard. Um, so next slide. Uh, yeah. So I know this was kind of just a lot that's come up that we need to fix, but. I'm hoping over the next uh, however many years we're able to start addressing it internally and then move forward to improving it even more um, and offering more services. And yeah, so Nakomik, thank you very much for listening. Miigwech and Nakomik Janelle. I would like to introduce our second speaker, Krista Uyuk Zawadski, um, who was raised in Igluliart. Igluli Garyuk, Chesterfield Inlet, and currently calls Rankin Inlet, Nunavut, her home. Krista is currently working for the government of Nunavut as a curator and is a member of the Winnipeg Art Gallery's Indigenous Advisory Circle. She is one of four co-curators of the inaugural exhibition Inua for the Hamayuk at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, which opens tonight. Congratulations, Krista. Krista, please go ahead and unmute. Um, Krista Uluyuyung, Igluli Gaktumi, Birok Saktum, Nunavumi, Mana Ilina Raksima Yunga, Ottawa, me, Uma Okalutunga, uh, Mana Nuna, Nuna Kaktumi, Algonquin and Snabbing me, Nunagani, Koyana make the Gwani to tell Yunagama. Um, I have a next slide, please. Uh, today, thank you. Today, I will be talking about you know art and collections management. Um, what the focus? What the focus on the government of Nunavut collection and our partnership with the Winnipeg Art Gallery? Uh, next slide. 
here's a little outline of uh, some of the things that I'll be talking about. I thought it might be um, important to give you a little primer on Inuit art because I'll be focusing on that collection in particular. And the, his the Inuit art history is um, ties into the collection in a few ways. And um, I'll give a brief history of the government of Nunavut collection and then the partnership that we have with the Winnipeg Art Gallery. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about Palmayuk and Ino, the inaugural exhibition. And then we have a question period at the end. Um, next slide, please. So um, thank you, Linda, for the introduction and thank you, Janelle, for your great presentation. Um, I am Krista Uliuk and I come from Igloodigaktuk and Rankin Inlet Nunavut on the western shore of Hudson Bay. And I was raised in a small town in a close-knit family and everything I know and value has been taught to me and shared with me from my family. And um, I just wanted to recognize that, you know, a lot of the things that, a lot of the work that I do and the research that I do uh, is always connected to my roots and my family and my language and community. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so I'll give you a little bit of information on Inuit art. Like I said, this is a graph from Nunavut Siwuniksavut, which is at Inuit College in Ottawa. Um, and this is a, the graph that they use in their curriculum. This is from 2014, so I, it's a little bit outdated. I think there's some new developments since then. Um, but um, so this graph outlines the connection or the contact Inuit had with people outside of Nunavut or um, outside of Inuit Nunat or Inuit homelands. And I'm sharing this with you uh, to give you an idea of how that history influenced the Inuit art history in Nunavut. But I'm not really going to delve into the long history of Inuit art um, prior to the contemporary period. That's not the focus of this talk. And but I'm going to start this conversation with the contemporary Inuit art period, which began around, you know, the late 1940s, um, as some art historians will tell you. Um, James Houston, James Houston uh, introduced this art, Inuit art, uh, to the Canadian Handicrafts Guild in Montreal and they encouraged him to return to the north and to buy more carvings and then they sponsored an exhibition promoting Inuit art carvings in the south and this was really the beginning of Inuit um, coming into the art market and then after that the Canadian federal government saw the potential of the um, promoting Inuit art as a way to drive the economy in the Canadian Arctic. And so Inuit owned cooperatives began to open across many Arctic communities during the 1950s and 60s. And they were supported through marketing initiatives in Southern Canada. And the marketing of Inuit art in the South would lead to the establishment of Inuit art as a major contemporary art form that attracted international interest. And so going back to this uh, NS curve that we like, we, we call it the NS curve, um, the graph here, hopefully you could see where uh, Inuit art history is influenced by some of the social issues and daily lives of Inuit. And, um, you know, for contemporary art, you could see, for example, I'm sure a lot, a lot of you are, or might be familiar with Annie Putubok's art. Um, you could kind of see where her art could fit into here. When you think about the older art, uh, you know, small carvings and that sort of thing. And the Inuit art uh, history, you could see where that kind of fits in with, um, you know, the late 1960s when there was not a lot of contact with the art market, but later on with more contact uh, with the outside world and more um, Inuit addressing uh, social issues in our lives, you could see how that influenced contemporary art like and Putugos art. Uh, next slide, please. 
So how does this fit into the, what the GN collection, the government of Nunavut collection, the work that comprises the works that comprise the GN fine art collection is mostly contemporary art. And um, these objects are largely divided into six main types. There's prints, <clears throat> drawings, sculptures, wall hangings, ceramics, and clothing. However, artists also work in other mediums, you know, tattoo, painting, basketry, video, film, photography, comics. Um, and, but here I just wanted to show you some of the pieces from our collection. Um, here are some of the artists that you might recognize, you know, Napachi Putugok, Uvilok Tunilde, Polusi Kapik. And uh, I'm hoping, you know, this will help situate you with Inuit art. Uh, next slide, please. Some other well known um, sculptures include Uvilok. Again, I meant to change that, but trust me, there are way more carvers than Ubiko, but um, you know, she's a great example. And Kulayuk Kiyutik Kakchuk. Next slide, please. Um, and some well known printmakers are include people like uh, Niokuluk TV and Kinwayok Asivak. I'm sure a lot of you recognize some of this art, especially the Kinwayok pieces. Um, next slide, please. And here are some examples of the wall hangings that I mentioned earlier. These are um, felt um, pieces of cloth where um, other felt pieces are cut and applicate onto the felt, um, the, the background there, and then they're hung up on the wall. So some two influential artists in this media are Jesse Una, as you can see here, and Mary Yusipik Singapti. This is my daughter, Mia. Um, next slide, please. In 1999, it was a pivotal year in the history of Nunavut. It was the year that Nunavut um, separated from the Northwest Territories and became a distinct territory of its own. And, you know, at that time, they had to organize a new territorial government and establish itself as a 2 million square kilometer territory. Along with that, um, Nunavut inherited a number of museum collections from the former large Northwest Territories. And these collections I have to highlight are publicly owned and are influenced by a number of factors uh, such as public funding programs or even you know, who is on staff to coordinate uh, projects or acquisitions. But as a whole, the GN collections include um, a paleontology collection with over 5,000 pieces. There is an ethnographic um, collection with over 2,500 belongings in there. There's an archaeology collection with over 148,000 pieces or objects or artifacts. Um, a natural history collection with 2,300 pieces and, uh, and our fine art collection, which is the focus of this talk, um, has over 7,400 pieces in it. That's, um, that's a lot of, that it, ma it makes for a quite large collection overall. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, like I said, The history of the Nunavut and Northwest Territories has um, directly affected the collection in a number of ways. And this is the fine art collection here, this graph. Um, for one, there are a large number of works that were accessioned in particular years. Uh, as you can see, you know, around the late 60s and 70s and early 80s um, is kind of the peak. Uh, this was due to the fact that the government 
had programs that were, like I mentioned, initiated to promote the economy in Inuit uh, communities. And some of these programs included printmaking workshops, ceramics workshops, you know, the Rankin Inlet Ceramics has that history there and that's, you know, it's part of this uh, government funded um, initiatives. And, you know, the introduction of the wall hanging artistic techniques was through these workshops. And after these workshops were completed, the government typically purchased or accessioned a lot of the art that was created. But in later years and leading up to the creation of Nunavut, a lot of these workshops and programs ceased. And, and you could see the effect it has on the collection this way. There were, no, there were not a lot of art, new works that were being accessioned. Uh, next slide. And in 1999, when the collections were transferred to Nunavut, um, a museum, there was no museum in Nunavut at that time. And it's, there hasn't been a museum or storage facility that's been developed in Nunavut since the creation of Nunavut. And <clears throat> so alternatively, um, different types of arrangements had to be made for where these collections are going to be, to where they're going to go while we wait for a facility in Nunavut. And um, the, some of these arrangements, these alternate arrangements, you know, they're temporary, but basically what was agreed upon was that the collections had to be stored in different places, which is, you know, it's not ideal, but this is uh, how it, it is what it is. Um, for example, the paleontology collection was previously stored at the Canadian Museum of Nature facility. And um, so it was a natural fit to extend the long-term loan agreement with the CMN in that way. And, you know, my department had, look, had looked at different solutions. You know, do, we, do they rent out a space, a storage facility space in a warehouse? Um, or do they uh, create new partnerships with existing institutions? And this is the case with the fine art. Like I said, the fine art collection has over 7,300 pieces. And uh, through a new partnership with the Winnipeg Art Gallery in 2015, uh, next slide please. Um, the art collection, went on long-term loan at the WAG. And in 2020, when the first agreement had expired, a new one was um, renewed or the, it was extended for another five-year uh, long-term loan. <clears throat> and, uh, and at the time, an exhibition was developed to celebrate this agreement at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, as you can see this in this photograph here. Um, next slide, please. And, you know, when the art, you know, it took several, you know, semi-trucks, truck loads to transfer the art from Yellowknife at the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Center to the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Um, I think it was quite the endeavor and you could see the Winnipeg Art Gallery staff had to unload boxes and boxes of art and catalog them and fit them into their storage spaces. Next slide. Uh, the WAG handles a lot of the collections management duties on behalf of the GN, including updating data, loan requests and research requests. Uh, we currently don't have anyone in Winnipeg from the government of Nunu that works um, with the collection directly. And that was um, a lot of the work that I did previously and prior to COVID, I was traveling to Winnipeg a lot to do this work. Um, as part of the agreement, the WAG uh, does special projects and programs with the collection, including putting them on display in exhibitions. So um, for example, Jocelyn, who's the uh, Winnipeg 
art gallery assistant curator of Inuit art has used the collection in a lot of ways in her short time at the WAG in the last few years, which is phenomenal. And um, another project that we did that I worked with um, with the Winnipeg Art Gallery Collections Manager, Nicole, was to update artist names to current spellings and identifying unidentified artists. Uh, we've transcribed signatures on the art and uh, tried to fill out the record data as much as possible. You know, this is an important and ongoing process. Inuit spelling conventions and preferences have changed significantly um, over time. And, you know, when the GN collection was originally catalog, cataloged, a lot of these, we had to check the artist names because a lot of them have changed or they were misspelled. And in pre-COVID times, the GN had hired a full-time staff person, Joe, to focus on the data management and updating the catalog so that we can be more confident in the quality of the data. Uh, next slide. The projects, the second project uh, that we worked on in the last few years was to have every artwork available online in an online database with professional photography. Uh, this is a two branch project, one involving the photography and the other obtaining copyright clearances to post these images online. In pre-COVID times, we had a full-time art handler, as you can see Lane here, um, and, uh, and uh, we had a company help obtain copyright clearance for a lot of these works. But both of these projects, the digitization and um, uh, the projects that Joe was working on have been put on hold because of COVID restrictions. But, you know, at the end of the day, the goal was to make the collection more accessible. That's what's really important to the government of Nunavut in our department, the Department of Culture and Heritage. We want these collections as accessible as possible and user friendly. And it's been great to work with the Winnipeg Art Gallery in that sense. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, as in my position as the curator of Inuit art, I've worked with um, other divisions within my department to create these programs uh, to make the collections accessible, including uh, doing artist workshops. We brought any you know, artists from across Nunavut down to Winnipeg for a week-long program of artist um, workshops and training. Um, and we've also did artist residencies in one of these art centers. Uh, here's um, cuisine at the Jesse Unak Center in Baker Lake. He was there for over a month, I believe. Uh, and it's, uh, Jesse Unak is a printmaking uh, facility that does uh, embroidery and wall hanging. And there it's, um, it's got this long history of um, doing these types of things in um, with especially with the government initiatives that I talked about in the 70s. Um, we've also worked together during that time we did a uh, printmaking workshop with the local community of Baker Lake at the end of Cuisine's artist residency there and uh, wall hanging embroidery workshop. Um, that way we were engaging local community with um, art forms. And, um, you know, these were really well received. And in my opinion, they were quite successful. Uh, next slide. And, you know, our department tries to find creative ways to make the collection accessible. Um, because we know that, you know, Nunavut is one fifth of Canada's landmass and it's pretty large. So um, we have to find ways to engage with all the communities in uh, Nunavut 
in Nunavut. And one way is that we've been curating um, art in uh, the Iqaluit airport. And, you know, they get a lot of traffic. So a lot of the this art, the display case here, we change it every four to six months. Um, and, you know, it, like I said, they get a lot of traffic. So they've been getting a lot of access in that sense. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the biggest challenge in this partnership with the WAG has been working close, is working closely with people across the vast distances. And we are developing many programs and exhibitions involving this collection. Uh, we frequently meet with um, the, the WAG staff to think of ways to utilize the collection and make it accessible. Uh, next slide. So how does this all work with Kaumayo? Um, Kaumayok is, its official opening is tonight. And um, coincidentally, so I invite you all to RSVP and join in on the celebrations. And um, there's a, it's a two part virtual opening. So tomorrow there'll be, I think it's focusing more on the ceremony around uh, the opening of this beautiful space. And through the partnership with the WAG, a lot of the art has already been used in different exhibitions, like I said. Um, but now a lot of this art is on display in the visible vault in um, Ilovut, in the foyer entrance of Kaumayuk. And it helps make the art a lot more accessible to a lot more people. You know, the, a lot of this art is coming out of storage, which is phenomenal. Uh, next slide. The Kaumayuk was originally envisioned I think in it began in the in 2012, I believe, with the working group. And but it was way before I started in my position as curator. Here you could see uh, the Winnipeg Art Gallery on the right, and Kalmayok is on the left, the more white building here. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's the model that gives you an idea of the two buildings, but you know, at the end of the day, it is all the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Um, Uh, next slide, please. So um, the Winnipeg Art Gallery created an Indigenous advisory circle that was co-chaired by Dr. Heather Igluliokti, who's on um, the left here, and Dr. Julie Nagam. And in the group photo here, you could see members of the advisory circle. And we worked together over a number of years to help develop the programming around the opening of Kaumayok and you know some of the things that we could do or Kaumayok could do in the Winnipeg Art Gallery could do to indigenize the spaces. And um, the members included people from across Manitoba and Canada and a lot of Inuit from across Inuit Nunangat, including urban Inuit. And um, next slide, please. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just glossing over that because uh, I don't want to take up too much time there, but one of the defining features of Kaumayok is uh, Ilavut, you know, the, the visible vault here. And this allows for immediate access for to the collections. The, this visible vault includes the WEG and GN collections. It, it's a very creative and practical way to make them more accessible. Um, next slide. And you could see here how immediately it's used for um, other things, you know, so not just viewing the art, but here you could see Michael Kusuga talking about the art, but he's also used the space as a storytelling space already, even before it opened. And we also used it um, for Inuit sports here. You know, it's a great space to do this type of thing, to engage with the art, but also, you know, it opens up other um, fun things that you could do. Uh, next slide. The, so I'll talk a little bit about the inaugural exhibition, Inua. So here's the curatorial team. 
that on the left is Kaputzak, and then myself, and then Sinayak and Heather Igluliokti on the far right. Um, one of the main aspects of our show was to, you know, in a way, give public access. I mean, I mean, give access to the public in a broad scope of what you know art is, and I think that we achieved that. And I, you know, I'm really honored to be part of this ex uh, curatorial team. We worked really hard to uh, represent as many Inuit as we could in uh, Inuit art, the range of Inuit art. Uh, next slide. We were, uh, you know, we cognizant of how we wanted to make the show as accessible as possible through Heather's Inuit Futures grant program. Uh, we were able to create an audio guide of the exhibition for each of the, we have over a hundred works in the show by 91 artists, Inuit artists. And, um, you know, that's a lot of art in the exhibition, but to create an audio guide and to have it, it's, it's not online yet, but it will be online, um, was one way that we wanted to make it accessible for the public, but also for other Inuit. And it, it makes a more meaningful interaction with the art, I believe, you know, especially with it being online. And from the very beginning, we knew that we wanted to make the show accessible to Inuit and Indigenous people. We worked to ensure that opening events and private events for Inuit artists and their families um, happened before the opening, which is, like I said, today and tomorrow. And you know, the, this prioritize, prioritized Inuit and Indigenous engagement with the art and the collections and the space. And I've already seen a lot of posts on social media of how, uh, how much people love it. The people that have been able to go into the space. Uh, we had Indigenous Day on Monday. And so people had gone in. And to me, that, that just warms my heart. People that I would never think would ever really want to go to a gallery um, or museum went to the Kaumayok and to the WAG and we're posting about how much they loved it. And, you know, that to me, is, it, it already shows the impact that Kaumayok is making on people, especially through making it accessible in the ways that I outlined. Um, next slide. So like I said, tonight and tomorrow are the official virtual openings of Kaumayok and Inua, and I invite you to RSVP. Um, so that you could watch and participate. It promises to show a lot of Indigenous talent and voices. Next slide. Uh, in closing, I wanted to emphasize that all of these projects and partnerships and programs uh, would not have been achievable without the commitment of working together and I hope that this is a key message that we see threaded um, throughout the symposium. And um, thank you for, for coming. Uh, the last slide here is um, my contact information if you would want to get in touch with me. So thank you. Hi, Anami Krista. Um, we now have some time for a Q&A session, and I encourage you to please put any questions you have in the Q&A box that's located at the bottom of your screen. Um, we do have some questions to begin with. And our first question comes from Jeanette, who has asked, and this was directed to uh, during Janelle's presentation. Um, so Janelle, how has your project identified what must not be digitized? What knowledge is not for everyone to access and is personal or secret? So our project, the Listen Here Voices project was mostly engaging with communities, but there was another initiative that ran alongside this one called uh, We Are Here Sharing Stories. And um, that one was working with LAC's collections that are in-house. So that project, um, which I also worked on a little bit 
focused more on updating descriptions. It focused more on finding people's actual names, like Krista was mentioning, because a lot of the time they're spelled wrong or they are wrong. Um, and it's, so it's important to get those back. And also um, with the workshop, the cultural guidelines working group, sorry, um, we're working on how um, like how to set up, <clears throat> sorry, set up a proper way to contact communities to ask, you know, how they would like this material to be restricted. Like um, we wanna be able to set up a restriction so that only, only certain people can see certain items because yes, some items are sacred. So we've removed a lot of items from being accessible to the general public since I started. Or if we have photographed like pictures of an album, we've blacked out certain images of like um, certain cultural practices. Um, yeah, th there's there's still some stuff that's under review, but but we're we're getting through it case by case. <laughs> Sorry. Question from the same Oscar: um, What is being done to update the terms in library and archives collections? And that's also you, Janelle. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's basically well, we have Indigenous advisors, so the advisors will receive. Um, either mentioned from ourselves as the archivists or from community members, we'll contact them directly if they know them. Um, and they'll say, uh, this is not appropriate, we need to update it. So like, I, I spend time scrolling through and I'm like, this, this one needs to change and add it to the list. And then at that point it goes to record control. And they've been really good working with us because there's so many <laughs> so many things that need to be updated so they have a huge list that they're like working through because they have to do it all manually through the back but but yeah it's basically just us being like you have to fix it it's, it's great that you're there <laughs> so, um and the next question is sort of related are there any efforts being made to respectfully capture oral knowledges through digitized audiovisual files to reflect customary and timeless oral traditions And that's that. Sorry again, Janelle. <laughs> this was, this came up during your presentation, so I I'm so believing. it's not LAC's mandate to capture that type of material. And actually, we're trying to maybe move away from accessions of certain material that would be better, like better serves different repositories or like local repositories. Um, so I think that like a lot of if, if we have things, we've tried to digitize them and make them accessible, but if we don't have them, it's not our place to try to go out, seek them out. That's really up to an individual or a community on how they want to do that. If, if someone donates something to us, then we're probably gonna suggest that they, you know, think about donating it to a local repository instead, um, but yeah. Good advice, thank you. Um, and then we have just a comment I, uh, from Pauline McLeod Farley. Excellent presentation, Janelle. Keep working. You are making a difference. So I just wanted you to hear that um, because it wasn't in the chat. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we, I know that we have a question. There was a question in the chat from Laura Pierce, and this is directed at both presenters. What do you feel are the key things archives, museums, or museums can do to remove barriers for Indigenous people. Uh, Laura loved Krista's statement about having people visit who might not otherwise visit a gallery. Um, I think one of the key things is um, just having, especially for um, non-Indigenous curators or collections managers or um, um, staff, one of the key things is having, you know, this um, cultural competency, um, you know, having training or even language training um, of some of the um, cultural groups or languages that you have in your collection. Um, I think that's one of the key things that helps to bring down barriers because oftentimes people um, might miss things, you know, if they're not familiar with the culture um, or language that they're working with. 
you know, the, my coworker, uh, Nicole Fletcher at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, who is the collections manager, you know, she's taking it on her own um, to learn Inuktitut you know, um, as much as she can. Um, but also she's teaching herself to learn to read syllabics so that she could read um, the names on the artworks. And that's what I mean about having cultural competency and like um, being aware of the collections. I think that's really important, but it also opens up, it makes the people who are in the collections more um, accessible in terms of um, people feel, feeling comfortable to approach them or to work with them, right? You know, if you know that it's, you're working with someone that really cares about the collection and um, then that makes a huge difference. The other thing is um, fees, you know, a more practical thing is um, having fees waived for Indigenous people to access collections. You know, if you want photographs of your family from archives, and these are, you know, historical photographs or old photographs, it's like, I don't want to pay a fee to uh, get these family photographs of my ancestors. You know, that, that's a, a simple practical thing that you could do to um, remove that barrier. Great. And uh, at, at this sort of um, sort of intersects with Belinda Harrow's question, Krista, how do you meet copyright and reproduction rights when working with online sharing of contemporary art? On, on the topic or, of that's how, a, do I, how do you meet copyright and reproduction rights when working with online sharing of contemporary art? Like, is there an agreement in place with the artist to be able to um, reproduce their digital images online or? Um, I'm not, like I said, um, we have someone that's working on this. I'm not familiar with um, copyright as much as I should be. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, there are, we, we, there are processes to, we um, obtain copyright and we work with, um, you know, like we follow Carfax and Carfax fees and that sort of thing. Right. So I'm sorry, I can't really answer your question there. <laughs> um, so, and we have a question from Beverly Cochran, who or where would be the most appropriate individual or organization to assist in providing more information about Inuit objects? We have a model of a Hayek in our collection that doesn't necessarily fit our collection's mandate. Um, and they also wonder if it was commercially made or Inuit made. Um, I can... If you know where it's from, that could help you point you in the right direction of who to contact. But I know people in like Haluit who do a lot of um, a, a lot of kayak research, and they might be more suited to answer this question and help you figure out, you know, was it made commercially or um, by who even or where across the Arctic was it from, you know, what if this is from Alaska? Well, this is part of it, you, you ask around and we could help point you in the right direction. So if you want, you could email me and I can help you figure that out. Great, thank you. And hopefully Beverly caught your email address um, at the end of your presentation, but maybe um, um, Mary can put it into the chat if that's okay with you. We have another question, sorry, Krista. <laughs> um, for, our, for Krista, our Museum Association in Nova Scotia worked with IHT a number of years ago on a collections database initiative that focused on making community collections accessible. I loved to hear what you said about collaborating and would love to chat more about the pro that project, where it ended and possibilities of picking it up again. So I'm wondering if that's more of a sort of private conversation with you and Karen Kirsted. So yeah, I put my email in the chat. Um, I'll put both of my emails. So if you can see it there, then great. 
finished. Um, so Skyly Storm Hogan writes, are identification requirements and cultural or emotional support issues being addressed for Indigenous people accessing museums at Library and Archives Canada? So that's a Janelle question. I'm not quite sure what you mean. <laughs> Skyly, did you want to elaborate on your question? I'm wondering if this is um, in terms of like, how do you identify as maybe an indigenous person when you access the library and archives, but I'm not sure about the cultural and emotional support. Yeah. I know that internally we're working on getting staff trauma training because when we are processing you know, it's different. A lot of times when we're processing stuff, it's stuff that actually happened to our families. Um, so it, a lot of times we have to take like a lot of breaks. It can, it, it's a lot. Um, and we're working on getting Indigenous staff uh, trauma training. But um, Yeah, I, we're trying to put disclaimers on certain materials as well so that people are aware of the contents and that they might be triggering. Uh, even materials you wouldn't assume would be triggering because it could be an album, might have triggering content in them. But we're still working out like the finer details on how to do that for um, especially the, the videos, the visual like videos, how to put them on that because if we're digitizing something we can't always put like a, a clip at the beginning. Um, yeah, and then as far as like collection materials go, as we're, I don't know, as we're going through them, we can identify which ones have to do with First Nations, Inuit or Métis communities, but I, I haven't been at LAC long enough really to get to get really into this, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Janelle. Okay, um, I'm not sure if we did this question yet. My question to, um, oh, uh, the follow-up from Karen was, my question to align with that would be, what is the government of Nunavut doing to support local communities on sharing stories, uh, info and collections? So the initial uh, message from Karen was for Krista, our museum association in Nova Scotia worked with IHT a number of years ago on a collections database initiative that focused on making community collections accessible. I loved to hear what you said about collaborating and would love to chat more about the project, where it ended and possibilities for picking it up again. So if you could uh, speak a little bit about um, what the government of Nunavut is doing to support local communities on sharing stories, information and collections. Thank you. Um. So in my department, Department of Culture and Heritage, um, we have funding sources available for um, people to access uh, if they wanna do local programs and there's a range of funding available for local communities. Uh, that also means on the flip side that our department doesn't have access to those types of funds because we're giving out these funds. Um, and but that also means that sometimes we can't necessarily do um, these types of programs ourselves within our department. And um, so it creates a bit of a conundrum there being the government of Nunavut. But it's also contingent upon who we have on staff. Like I mentioned, who we have on staff affects the collection in many ways. And in my department, we have few staff that does museum collection work. So that's hindered some of the projects that we could do, but there is a, there are other divisions within the government, like the D division of uh, elders and youth that does this type of work. Um, and that's not the division I'm in. So I'm not too familiar with what they do necessarily, um, but I know that they have done programs like that. Also in that division, there is someone who's working full-time uh, kind of like doing uh, as a genealogist. 
that is helping flesh out a lot of these oral histories. And this is a relatively new project that's happening in our department. So, um, you know, there's, there's some projects like that that are happening, but a lot of times we're putting the onus on community to, to come up with these projects and then we would support them, of course. Okay. And I believe this could be to both. Do you, uh, you have any suggestions about how to reach out to artists in remote rural communities? We run an acquisition program and we consistently receive a lower number of applications from Inuit artists. And it says Danny Shrestha. Hi, Danny. <laughs> so um, do you I, I think for me, the, the, the easiest way to reach the most number of people is through local radio. And like Nunavut has 25 communities and no highways. So we often rely a lot on local radio to advertise these things. You could fax in, because a lot of these places uh, don't necessarily have email, but you could fax in your advertisement and they'll read it on the local radio, which is great. Um, and then there are uh, local organizations that you could reach out to. Um, the, like in the Kivalek where I'm from, it's the region, there's seven communities in our region and we have a local uh, liaison officer that is hired through the Regional Inuit Association. So they're the ones, people like that are the ones to reach out to, to, re to reach local um, people, but also um, language, you know, having things accessible in Inukitut is a really important thing. If you wanna reach Inuit artists, especially older artists that might not be able to read English very well. You know, most people will read Inuktitut. Excellent. I used to work, and that question comes from Danny Shrest and I used to work with Danny and, and that was always a challenge to, uh, to reach out. Um, and, and well, well, not a challenge to reach out so much as get responses back. So, so thank you, that's, that's very useful. And I'm just trying to filter through because the, I'm sorry, the Q&A, they're coming in different orders um, as, as, <laughs> as um, they're being written. So I think we've done most of the questions. There was a, um, a follow up for Janelle um, about, um, so Skyline, also I meant that there are trauma issues when accessing materials and, and you address that. I've seen people go into crisis distress, which is, which is something we're all familiar with, um, but then followed it up. I know that some folks do not have required identification to get an access card at LAC. So are there um, mechanisms in place to, um, to address those populations? To be honest, I, <laughs> I did not have the opportunity to access physical records at LAC until I started working there because I lived in Labrador. So I really still to this day don't know how researchers access things at LAC um, because it was thousands of kilometers away from me. Um, but I do know uh, like there are certain people you can reach out to uh, if you reach out to the reference desk specifically or there's an email address for our initiative that you could reach out to who might be able to point you in the right direction uh, especially if you're looking for digital access to stuff um, I, I know that there's a way to set people up I've done it before but um, but restricted objects it gets complicated because then copyright law comes into effect um, which is something we're trying to work on if a donor puts restrictions on material that they've donated, regardless of whether the material has indigenous content, it could affect like how um, people access that material. Now we have removed images from restricted material like that before so that nobody gets to see them, but it's still like a huge thorn in my side. <laughs> That's the way that it works. So. And in the chat, we have um, a comment, not a question, just a statement from Polly McLeod Farley. I am working with the community on a new exhibit, which will have a disclaimer on the residential school portion of the exhibit. And we'll also have a bypass for people to choose to easily pass by the exhibit if it is too triggering or difficult for them to see it. Well, thank you for sharing that, Pauline. 
And, and I just, there was another note that Jeanette uh, was asking um, a question on any Inuit paleontology artists, storytellers, knowledge carriers that, uh, that you could introduce them to for a major developing pro project at the ROM. And they're also curious if either speaker can email them and they've included their email address there. Um, but it may just be easier for you, Jeanette, to reach out to our two speakers um, by accessing their emails um, on the Attendify uh, profile. Um, and so the question is, if you know any Eastern Labrador Inuit or Inu artists, storytellers or knowledge carriers that are aware of whale hunting knowledge. So, and I think that is it for our questions. And that brings us to the end of our time. And they're great. Jeanette uh, saw that in and commented in the chat. And so I, at this point, um, I wanna thank you, Janelle and Krista for taking the time to share aspects of the important work that you do with us today. I loved hearing about your experiences, which resonated with me deeply. Your presentations were thoughtful and generous and I appreciate the way in which you identified issues and challenges as well as practical strategies for addressing them.